Well, good evening. Uh, welcome to the third session of Cross Shaped Marriage. And uh, we're thinking this evening about cross shaped expectations from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Uh, I won't read the passage now, but I do encourage you to have a look at that if you haven't done so already. And let's pray together before we start. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the example of our Lord Jesus. Thank you for what he did for us and the example that he gives to us. And we pray that you would give us the help and the strength that we need to follow his example so that we might bless and love each other more effectively and in a, in a way that honours you, but also to, to bring you glory through our lives and through our relationships. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's been lots of books written on marriage, uh, but one book for me uh, really stands out because of its title. Uh, it's written by uh, an author called Paul David Tripp, um, and this is the, the title of the book. It's called, What Did You Expect? And I think that's a really thought provoking title for a book on marriage. What did you expect? The expectations that we have of our relationships are really important to how we act in those relationships and how likely those relationships are to grow and flourish. I think our enjoyment of our relationships are linked to our expectations of them. And when it comes to marriage, our expectations can be influenced by all kinds of things. Uh, it might be influenced by our parents' marriage and, and the way uh, our parents were in their marriage might affect the way that, that we think about marriage. Uh, the views of our friends and family on marriage. Uh, the views of the culture around us. The expectations we might get for what marriage should look like from films, TV, books, songs, or there might be views of marriage from our church culture, and that might not always be helpful either. But we've seen over these past few weeks that marriage starts with God. God gives us the pattern for marriage. He tells us what marriage should look like. And marriage is shaped by the gospel. And marriage is empowered by the gospel as the Holy Spirit fills us and enables us to live out the pattern that God has called us to follow. So it makes sense then that our expectations for marriage should be shaped by the gospel. We should have cross-shaped expectations for our marriages and for all our relationships. We should expect in our marriages and in, in all that we do as Christians to follow Christ's example of sacrificial service. That's what the reading in Philippians 2 shows us. And this passage helps us to get our expectations right when it comes to marriage, as well as all our relationships in the church. It helps us to see what our mindset should be as those who are citizens of heaven. It shows us how to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. And we do that through intentional, selfless, sacrificial service for the sake of others. I just want to break down that phrase into different parts. Intentional, selfless, sacrificial service for the sake of others. Uh, let's start with uh, intentional. We should expect to be intentional in our marriages. A number of years ago now, uh, the DJ Norman Cook, um, also known as Fat Boy Slim, and his then wife, uh, Zoe, Bo Zoe Ball, they uh, put out a very sad message on Twitter. You know, they shared that um, after 18 years of marriage, uh, their relationship had come to an end and they decided to separate. And the quote that they both gave uh, was this. They said, we have come to the end of our rainbow. And I thought that was 
quite an interesting way to think about marriage as a rainbow. You know, something that is very beautiful, but also very transient as well. I mean, a, a rainbow is here one moment and it's gone the next, isn't it? In fact, that's one of the beautiful things about rainbows, that they just appear without you expecting them. And then they disappear as quickly as they came. And I think that's how a lot of people might think about marriage today. I mean, it's like a beautiful rainbow. It's not permanent. It appears in your life, but it might not always last. There may come a time when the love fades, just as the colours of the rainbow fades. And when that happens, the relationship disappears into thin air. But that's okay because, well, the rainbow was beautiful while it was here. And the good thing about rainbows is they keep appearing that there'll be another rainbow. There might be a, another relationship, maybe with stronger and more vibrant colours than the previous one. And so that there can be this expectation um, in the world around us that relationships come and go. They will appear and they will fade away. And there's this idea, perhaps, that we can't force love. You can't try to keep the rainbow in the sky when the colours are fading. But the Apostle Paul has a different view of love. He tells us in verses 1 to 2 of Philippians 2 how we are to love. He talks about um, having in verse 1 and being in verse 2. Although there's a bit of crossover between the two. But um, having in verse 1, he talks about um, uh, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ. And he repeats that, that word, if, 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 if he have any comfort from his love, any fellowship with the spirit, any tenderness and compassion. And by saying if, he's not doubting whether they have these things. Now, what he's saying is more like, well, surely you do have these things. And on the basis of having these things, Union with Christ, comfort from his love, fellowship with his spirit, tenderness and compassion. Then make my joy complete by being, verse two, being like minded. One in love, one in spirit, one in purpose. Now, can you see the link between verse one and verse two? In verse one, Paul is talking about who we are as believers, who we are as those who are in Christ, what we have in Christ. And then he goes on to talk about how we are to live in Christ. It's not enough to have the things he mentions in verse one. We also need to be the things that, that he talks about in verse two, to live out those things. In other words, to live out the position and the identity that we have in Christ. And that means being intentional. And we've got to work at it. It's not enough just to be united together as a church or as a married couple. We've got to work on that unity. It's not enough just to have love being shared between us. We've got to work on that love we need to be loving as well as having love marriages start to fail when we forget that love and unity cannot be taken for granted that we need to work on these things and when you stop putting in the effort it's a downward spiral and the way that we work this out is governed by the next few verses we don't love selfishly to get something back. We love selflessly. Uh, and that's the next thing we should expect. We should expect to be selfless. Uh, verses three and four. Too many people go into marriage, in fact, any relationship, with this mindset. I love myself 
and I love what the other person can do for me. We might not admit that that's what we're thinking, but that thinking is there and deep in our psyche, deep under the surface. Now, that's because we are all, by nature, self-centered, self-seeking, self-serving creatures. That's what sin does. It turns us in on ourselves and it, it makes me the centre of the universe. Uh, now, in the past, people covered this over uh, with talk of doing one's duty, loving and obeying. People perhaps had more of a mindset in the past to seek the greater good, even at personal cost. But that cover up um, has, has faded away. Perhaps it, it was there more during the pandemic as people tried to serve each other and, and look after each other. But uh, it seems that many more people now in our society are unashamedly, unashamedly selfish, self-seeking and self-serving and self-centred. It's hard to imagine not having the word selfie in our dictionaries, but it's actually a, a relatively recent word. It's only about 10 years old or been used for, for 10 years, but it sums up our culture. We live in a selfie society. <clears throat> People unashamedly look after and look at number one. They put themselves in the center of the camera. They make it all about them. So what Paul is saying here in verses three and four is countercultural. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. You're know, posting that picture on Instagram of yourself or your nice house, your lovely dog, wherever it might be, uh, just so you can get more likes, so you can get more followers and popularity. Uh, or, or if social media isn't for you, dropping those little bits into conversation that you think might impress the other person. Selfish ambition and vain conceit. So rather than that, we serve others and value others above ourselves in humility. And when Paul talks about humility, he's not talking about um, putting ourselves down and, and making ourselves feel worthless. True humility uh, is actually taking the focus away from ourselves and onto somebody else. So we're not even thinking about ourselves. We're not putting ourselves down as such, that we're just thinking so much about another person that we don't think about ourselves. And then not looking to our own interests, but to the interest of others. And we might be fearful if we do this, that we will lose out. If I'm looking to other people's interests, who's gonna look at my interests? But this is a really liberating way to live. We find so much more joy and satisfaction in serving others and making sure that their interests are being met and, and their needs, rather than just seeking our own needs. And if we have this mindset, there'll be a radical change in our relationships. And I hope that that's already been lived out in our own relationships. And I go from the one who is served in my relationship, where it's about my needs being met, my agenda being prioritized, to the position of a servant. My expectation should be as a follower of Christ, that I will serve first, and be served second. And that if, if that is our mindset, then we will truly be Christ-like. We will be following in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus, because that is the same attitude that Christ displayed. Yeah, so we need to expect 
like Jesus, to serve sacrificially. A few years ago, I heard a very moving interview with a, a seminary professor called uh, Douglas Grotis. And he would, had written a book called Walking Through Twilight. And the book was about um, how he was caring for his wife, Rebecca, who had a rare form of dementia that affected uh, the part of the brain that was responsible for language. And he was talking in, in this interview about the choice that somebody has to make to give yourself to a life of service, to choose to serve somebody else sacrificially. He, he shared uh, anecdotally that he'd heard of, of, of some couples saying that, that if their spouse uh, would have become chronically ill, then that would have been a, a deal breaker, but that would have caused them to walk away from the marriage. So how was, was he able to sacrificially serve his wife with this horrific debilitating disease? Well, he said he, he went back to his marriage vows. He went back to the start of his marriage and the promises he made to his wife to love her in sickness and in health. You see, right from the start of his marriage, he had got his expectations right. And he knew that that his marriage would be about service, whether that was in health or in sickness. And, and he had to live out those promises, probably to an extent that he never imagined that he would have to. So this has to be our mindset. If, if we say we belong to Christ, but we're not willing to serve, then we're hypocrites. But we need to acknowledge as well that this is hard. It's easy to talk about sacrificial service, much harder to do it. It will cost us to live this way, to have this mindset, just as it cost Jesus. You know, it, it cost Jesus his rights. Jesus is the son of God. He had equality with God. Equality with God is not something that, that he had to grasp after. He already had it. He was worshipped and adored by the, the host of heaven. He enjoyed the perfect relationship with the Father in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit from before the beginning of time. And yet he made himself nothing. Not by pouring out his godness, not by losing his divinity, but by adding to his divine nature, a human nature. And what did that human nature look like? It looked like a servant. Of all the positions that Jesus could have taken up as a human being on this earth, he chose to take the position of a servant, the lowest position of all. He went from the highest place to the lowest place. He gave up his rights as the son of God, the one who ought to be served by all of his creatures to one who served his creatures. Although one day that situation will be reversed. One day every knee will bow before Jesus. One day all creation will serve him. But before this exaltation, there was a humbling. Jesus' sacrificial service cost him his comfort. Being a, a servant is not a comfortable position to be in. It will mean doing things for the sake of others that might be to our own de detriment. Like that husband caring for his wife. Caring in a way that, that took up huge um, emotional energy, a huge cost physically, financially. And yet Jesus' cost was even higher. His service led him to the cross. It cost him his life. The most horrific 
death that anybody could ever die. So sacrificial service is hard, but Jesus shows us that it is worth it. It's worth it because of what God can do through it. That Jesus' sacrificial service was redemptive. Now, ours uh, won't have that same effect. We don't redeem um, our spouse or anybody else through our sacrificial service. Uh, but our service of others can be used by God in, in, in transformative ways. You're somebody who has a spouse whose heart has grown hard and cold towards them. They, they, God can use the sacrificial service of, of, of the partner to soften and to warm that hard, cold heart. It's worth it as well because of what God does for our sacrificial service. He rewards it. And we shouldn't shy away from the fact that there is a reward for our service of God. And one day we will share in Jesus' glory if we have shared in his sacrificial service. So if this is what our lives should look like, if this is what our relationships should look like as followers of Christ, then how are we matching up to this expectation? Are we being intentional are we being selfless are we being sacrificial in our relationships and particularly in our marriages uh, if we're not as we reflect um, on our relationships today then how do we need to change what areas of, of our lives of our marriages do we need to change how are we going to um, live up to this expectation that we're given in God's word to be intentional to be selfless and to be <clears throat> sacrificial uh, it, we can't change everything overnight but we can start somewhere so what will that will be what will be the first step for us you know, towards this intentional selfless sacrificial service for the sake of others uh, well, there are some, some questions um, for you to help you think through this um, and included in the, in the questions is an expectation survey um, and this is to help you think about your own expectations for marriage um, and you can rate different areas of life and marriage um, on a scale of one to five uh, one being not so important five being very important um, but also to rate it on behalf of your spouse as well and if you do that separately but then um, but the fun bit is then when you come together and you compare your notes and, and what your expectations are and what you think your partner's expectations are and how they can compare to uh, reality so i encourage you uh, to have a look at that uh, and if you need the questions then we can send them to you just send us an email and we'll get those questions to you um, thank you for joining us this evening and uh, I hope that it's been helpful and I encourage you to, to pray and as you look at those questions together.